Hey, I'm Jason Park with the Hyper 2 Podcast, and today I'm here with writer, director, man of many hats, John Ornoy. John, how are you doing today, sir? Doing great. How about you? Good, good. So let's get right into the ham and potatoes. What made you want to become a director? What made you want to make movies? You know, you have a film in the, on the way right now, releasing September 10th, Lost in the Shuttle. How did you get there? Where did you start? Um, I did film school, did all those things. The movie that made me want to make movies is uh, Delicatessen. I'm not sure if you know that one. Uh, Jean-Pierre Genet, the guy that did Amelie, okay. uh, his first film. Uh, to me, that was, it's, it's, I mean, no such thing as really, I guess, is a perfect movie, but it's, that one's pretty damn close to perfect. And uh, I'd done some acting and writing and photography as a kid. So, uh, yeah, going to film school and bringing all those together, uh, really was a pretty natural thing. Uh, I live in Vancouver, which is a pretty big uh, film center. And so I spent a lot of time working on set and picking up my chops that way. And so yeah, this is the first feature that I've directed, but uh, produced and directed five shorts before and produced two other features. So I noticed, you know, uh, that you have an extensive history of like working behind the camera, you know, doing a little bit of everything. How did you get started in that? Because, you know, you have you have indie film guys that go out there and they just kind of do it. And then you have people that go the industry route. Like, how did you get to that point where it's like, hey, I'm, I'm on this set now, I'm working. And then how did that lead to other jobs? Uh, I chose to get into camera. Uh, I worked as a second AC uh, camera assistant for about 10 years. And uh, I liked that job because you were always busy, you're always doing something. Uh, and you were always around, you know, the action, uh, watching directors work. So uh, my philosophy was that uh, this would be a way of kind of, yeah, being involved in the action and learning from other filmmakers. You know, film school is good, but you're all amateurs. Um, and I think uh, I definitely learned a lot more by being on set mm -hmm. and and seeing the process uh, and learning, you know, how all departments work together. And I think that's a pretty invaluable thing to have as a director, to be able to speak uh, in the language uh, of all your departments and understand what their needs are. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say is like the biggest, uh, I guess, game changing lesson that you learned that you don't think you would have been able to learn in film school, being that you're on these professional sets working with these, you know, individuals that are experts in their craft? Um, I think probably the most important thing is just keeping your cool, um, because, you know, days are long, uh, things can get stressful and, uh, particularly when you're, you know, head of a department or overseeing lots of people, uh, the way that you act and the way that you carry yourself, um, has a huge effect on how everybody else below, below you works uh, and how their day is going to flow. So even if you can kind of keep your, keep your cool and keep your head, even when things are, uh, getting tight and you know running, running out of light um then i think that makes a pretty huge difference to how you know how successful the production is going to be okay so so walk me walk me through like the where were you when you decided to make your first project like like what was that thing that's like clicked for you and you're like okay i'm gonna make this project no matter what because i feel like as, as filmmakers we all have this this nagging voice that's like, yo, you have to do it. So what was that for you? Uh, I think I started working on set. I'd been probably assisting for a few years and it just had become a job. Um, you know, I told me I was punching in and out of the clock and I'd sort of lost sight of the reason I got into the industry and wanted just to make movies. Um, and so that kind of kicked my butt a little bit. Um, so I wrote a script that was all set in one location, uh, one room, basically. Uh, I was working on a TV series at the time called The L Word. And the uh, crew was super supportive. We you know, worked together a lot. And um, it was awesome. They all, like, we shot this during the season. And they all came out for with me for, like, one day uh, on one of our weekends. And, you know, as you know, weekends are very short when you work on set. Um, yeah. So it was really awesome. I was working as a camera assistant. And so I was loading all the mags. Um, I'm old enough that my career started working with film. And uh, so you got to one of the benefits of being a camera assistant is that you keep, care, keep track of the film inventory. And so I was able to collect, you know, a pretty good amount of short ends or the the course of the the season and so that covered all the film and then yeah we just went out there and did it and i knew that it was you know challenging to put together a production while working a 60 to 70 hour week 
but I knew that on the day when we showed up, I wasn't going to have to worry about, you know, if things are going to be lit properly or in focus because I had a great crew of all these really supportive people around me. Um, and I intentionally picked something that was, you know, manageable in scale, um, shot, like I said, in one day in one room. And um, I decided to try and do something small as well as I could, as opposed to extending, you know, the boundaries of the the scope of the project and doing something larger, uh, like 60 or 70 percent good. Sure. So would you uh, if you could go back in time, would you still having the knowledge that you have now, would you still make that first film in one location or would you have tried to expand uh, a little more? No, uh, like I'd never really worked with actors before. Um, I'd never directed much before. So I think starting small um, kind of kept it manageable and less stressful for me. Um, uh, it was a you know 10 page script. Uh, and yeah, like I said, I was working full time on on a series at the at the time. So the idea of extending, you know, being more ambitious, I think would have, the, the final product would have suffered for it. Got it. Got it. And what Okay, outside of the latest project, right? Because we always fancy the latest project. Um, what what project that you've done up until this point is your favorite? Uh, I think probably my previous feature that I produced is called uh, All Joking Aside. It's about a young woman who wants to... Um, get ahead in their career as a sound comic and the first night she goes out to perform an open mic night uh she gets heckled off the stage and runs away from it uh but when she finds out later that the comic used to be a pretty prominent guy before he drank it all away uh she decides to kind of lean into it and not be intimidated by him so the story becomes about the friendship that they form and uh, her finding her voice as a comic um that was a very hard production um to do on a very low budget uh with not enough help and uh, I nearly broke myself doing it. Um, but I'm definitely proud of what we were able to accomplish. I think the, um, the production value looks, you know, a lot higher than what the actual budget was. We've got some great performances, the uh, director did a, did a great job. And, um, that was like kind of the first real sort of commercial thing that I created that, you know, I was able to watch on TV and got sold in some places. And so that was sort of you know, the first thing that made me feel, feel confident that I could actually do this uh, as a career. So what, I, I guess on that project, what was, you said you had some difficult time, like what made it difficult? Uh, resources, like did it on a very slow, low budget. So there may be out of our, 17 day schedule i think there were five or six people that actually did every day so every day was a scramble for day calls and finding people because everyone was essentially coming out and volunteering sure. um the easiest day i had i think was we shot outside and one of my drivers who was also a grip like slipped and broke his hand uh one of the trucks was late because other guy slept in um and we had you know seven hours of daylight or something because we're shooting the winter that that was the easiest day every day beyond that was um just the logistical challenges uh i was doing everything from like catering to call sheets to crewing um i spent maybe five or ten percent of the entire shoot on set uh the rest of it was just running around like mad just trying to keep everything keeping the train on the track so yeah it, uh, it definitely pushed my uh, my abilities yeah that's you know that's one thing that's very interesting about uh indie filmmakers right so we have to wear so many hats to get a project made because for the majority of us financing and resources they're just not going to come they're not going to come our way mm -hmm. Um, so we have to be MacGyvers and get it done. But I, I think the one uh, unfortunate thing that does happen is your indie film with the limited pool of resources is always compared to the films that Hollywood releases. So like, yep. like no one cares like what we go through to try and get that picture. And, you know, it won't be perfect. The lighting here would be a little too hot or whatever it is because we have to shoot 10 scenes in three hours and we can't sit there and have the luxury of time. Um, what would you have changed differently about that project? I was just limited the scope, like the, uh, the script in its initial drafts, I think was definitely smaller. I had fewer kind of speaking parts, fewer locations. And then just as we were working on the script, I was working with the screenwriter. Um, there was a bit of mission creep and it slowly started expanding. And then by the time we were like putting it together, it's like, Oh, I'm casting like 
30 named parks and we have like 10 locations to get to yeah. and we're doing it in the winter um, when it's going to snow and it's going to be tough getting extras out uh, and we're doing comedy club scenes where you need people to come out otherwise it right. looks really weird right. um, so yeah, I think uh, yeah, I definitely the, the mantra of like do something small 100% good as opposed to something bigger like 60% good um, I think is uh, is one to definitely stick to so let's let's talk about your latest film right your latest baby Lost in the Shuffle mm -hmm. Give us the breakdown of this film. I, I, I want to know everything. And I want to know everything from the standpoint of like, okay, the person that loves gear. What camera did you shoot on? What lens did you shoot on? You know, the, how did you come up with the concept of this story? Like, I just want the whole breakdown. All right, so it's, uh, it's a documentary set in the world of magic. Um, I've been a fan of magic my entire life, uh, and it's a creative process. As a creative person, I'm really interested in because you know, film is such a collaborative process. Uh, I'm the engine of the project, but my credit list is gigantic because of all the other people's and their skills that I need. Um, but the primary uh, magician of the film, a guy named uh, Sean Farquhar, is a two-time world champion. He's been on Penn Teller's Fools a couple times and, and fooled them. Uh, he largely does everything himself. Like he literally built his theater. You know, he creates all his own illusions. He writes all the patter. He does everything on his own. Uh, and I think, in general, it's an art form that does not get the credit it deserves. Um, people don't take it seriously. And so the goal of the film was to educate people and show them, you know, just how hard it is to make it look, make it look easy, and that uh, there's a lot of philosophy philosophy and heart and passion that goes into it. So the film follows Sean and we talked to four of the other best of the sleight of hand artists in the world and specifically about playing cards because I'm also find that really interesting because for most of us playing cards are pretty inert objects. We look at them, we don't think about them much. They sit in a junk drawer or maybe we don't pull them out every once in a while to play a game of poker or something. but. Uh, put them in the hands of a magician and they become an endless creative muse like there's an uncountable number of card tricks that are already being created and an uncountable number that are still to come. And so I think all that creativity coming from one specific object is pretty fascinating. So we talked to all the magicians about their relationship with playing cards and um, you know why that is so important to them. Sean calls them the Swiss Army Knife of Magic. Uh, and then Sean's also got a pretty fascinating theory that hidden in the art of every standard deck of cards that they've ever held uh, are the clues clues to the uh, cold case murder of a French king in 1498. Uh, and when we first started hanging out and he laid out that to me, like that immediately grabbed my filmmaker brain as a pretty incredible hook um, because I just love the idea that this very calm, this is probably some of the most famous art in the world. Um, and, you know, even the magicians in the film that we talked to, none of them had ever really considered, you know, why the art looks the same way it does, the one looks the way it does. Um, the art that we have in the cards today uh, has evolved directly from designs that were created like 500 years ago. There's direct evolution. So like I said, the idea that these clues could be hidden in plain sight for 500 years, um, I thought was pretty engaging. So uh, started our process in like 2020. Um, so it's taken, a, it's taken, when did you guys complete it? 2023? Uh, like February of this year, we had our uh, world premiere at Hot Docs. Um, so it was about a four and a half year process. Wow. Um, the pandemic was uh, kind of a silver lining in the sense that it gave me a lot of time to sit at home and do research um, and write out the treatments. So that worked well. Uh, late 2021, we did a really successful uh, Kickstarter campaign. Um, we hit our initial target in like 12 hours and then ended up at about 300% of our uh, initial goal, which was you know far better than anything I've ever done with any of my other uh, crowd attempts at crowdfunding, and that had a lot to do with Sean, who's you know not necessarily a celebrity in the world at large, but um, is definitely well known and well regarded in the magic world, and that community really came out huge for us. Um, took me a little while to put together the rest of the financing, but we went to uh, start filming in March of 2023. Uh, did a short trip to the US and uh, did a bit of filming there. And then we did a 17 day trip in Europe. We went to 10 cities and six countries to film all of this. Um, uh, shot on a pair of red Komodo dragons. Um, so the traveling crew was myself, Sean, the producer, our DP and our sound, sound mixer. And then we hired a uh, crew um, and lights and group equipment at every city that we went along to. Uh, we also did uh, a super fun day shooting our title sequence uh, with the uh, the Phantom Flex um, and mounted on the 
I don't know what the name of the arm is, but the the motion control arm. Um, so that was super cool, um, and everything looks awesome when you're shooting at 2,000 frames a second. So most expensive day of the production, but um, went really well. Uh, and then, yeah, we had about nine months of editing and animation. Uh, there's some pretty cool animated sequences in the film uh, that the company in Vancouver called Jester's Animation did for us. And they did a really fantastic job. And yeah, and here we are now. So we had our world premiere in uh, May. And uh, now we've been doing a little theatrical tour of uh, seven cities uh, to kind of build up some awareness before the film uh, hits VOD on September 10th. So before I get on to the tour, that, that was a lot to digest. Thank you for that. Uh, the Red Dragon, um, what lens uh, did you guys use uh, for this project? Uh, I think we had a con collection of Zeiss, I think it was the Ultra Speeds or the Super Speeds, I, I can't remember. A uh, collection of primes and think a short zoom but i can't remember what the length was yeah yeah you know the interesting thing uh and i don't know if it, it like what was the reasoning for you to go with the red i know for me uh my last project we shot on the red komodo um that the way it renders color and the way you can push color and post is so beautiful that um i understand why a lot of people go red but what made you choose red for this documentary uh, to be honest, a lot of it was kind of practicality and availability. Um, uh, the rental house that uh, supported the project was uh, was really awesome and, and got us great deals. And the Komodo was what they had most available, and it's something that Colin or DP was comfortable working with. And it's also the form factor. You know, it's a tiny camera, um, so it's, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing that you can just you know travel your entire. Uh, camera package in one Pelican case, um, and with the amount of traveling that we were doing, uh, that was really essential. But uh, you know, there were five of us. We had like I don't know, between our personals and the equipment, uh, like fifteen bags or something. So uh, the less stuff and the smaller the form factor, the more practical it was for us. Sure, sure. And did um, when it comes did, was majority of this handheld? Was it on a tripod? Like how did you guys shoot the majority of it? Uh, a lot of it was on sticks. Uh, we also traveled with the, um, what was it called? The easy arm, the okay. over the head yeah, yeah. The stabilizer. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we had that, um, but it was primarily on sticks. We used the, the stabilizer, uh, judiciously um particularly in the uh, performances but uh, it was mainly mainly locked off stuff and then handheld when we were doing let's say uh, street performances like uh, capturing sean on the street doing magic um but i wanted to feel kind of you know uh, classic it wasn't uh, a very take kind of documentary where we were following life as it happened um you know the story all takes place 500 years ago um so yeah i wanted to kind of feel uh, controlled and cinematic in that sense sure so did you guys uh are you guys self-distributing or did you guys go through a distributor on the back end it's a it's a hybrid approach um so we have a distributor in canada that's uh, handling has all rights in Canada. Um, I'm working with Giant Pictures in the States to do U.S. Uh, do digital distribution. Uh, I've been doing all the theatrical and non-theatrical booking on my own. And then uh, I've got a sales agent that's helping trying to book some broadcast deals overseas. And then we have another company that's doing uh, airline cruises, uh, hospitals, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I don't like the idea of just giving all rights to one company. Um, I don't necessarily trust that. Uh, I, I was just about to ask you that. Why did you uh, <laughs> like? Uh, why did you go with almost like four different people? Like one for Canada, one for you have a U.S. sales agent, one for you know airlines. Like that's such a. I've only ever experienced okay one distributor. They kind of just handed the film and everything. But going four different you know uh, to four different companies to do that is that because of experience? Like what made you do that? <clears throat> yeah, I've had some bad experiences. Um, as a Canadian filmmaker, in order to qualify for my tax credits, I need to have a Canadian distributor. Like I can't have an American company or someone else selling in Canada. So from a very practical perspective, I need to have someone who's uh, Canadian based to handle those rights. Um, and then, yeah, I just, I, you hear so many horror stories. You know, there are good businesses and good 
distributors out there for sure, but there was also a lot of shady operations, and you know I've had the misfortune of, of running across some of them uh, with my previous projects, and um, just the idea that this thing that you invest so much of your life into, and I have investors, I'm invested in the film, um, and so you know uh, there's a lot riding on it, more a lot more riding on it for me than for that company, and the idea that you might give someone that you know your your life for the last five years and it they just decide that you know for whatever reason they're just not investing it you know mgs are are few and far between these days and so if that company doesn't have any skin in the game uh, and they have your rights locked up for five or ten years uh if they don't do anything with it your hoops and so i think there's definite value in, in working with companies um and the connections that they have and the abilities that they have to do things that i can't do on my own but i like the idea of having a hybrid approach where i am you know still controlling some amount of my my fate my destiny would you say that um, a sales agent is still a viable partnership or it's something that, you know, indie filmmakers should look at as far as getting their their projects into a more favorable deal? I think there's something to it. I mean, I did a lot of pitching on my own and I got fairly far with some places, uh, like going directly to broadcasters all over the world. Um, so, and my previous feature, you know, I did a bunch of sales on my own as well. And so I don't think it's impossible. Um, the one thing I learned during this uh, distribution now is that you can actually just contact cinemas across the country and just ask them if they want to play your film. And um, it's tedious. Um, wait, okay, wait, wait, hold on. So dive into that, right? So, cause you're doing the tour. So like what, yep. what cinemas are you reaching out to directly and then what is that process? How much does it cost to, to set that theater aside for the screening? You're doing your tour, like walk us through that. Um, so because it's a film about magic, I've been approaching uh, both magic theaters, which tend to be pretty small, like usually see about 30 people, but also indie cinemas. Um, I've only had to four wall one place. Uh, every other cinema I've done a 50-50 rev share with, and most have been happy with it. Uh, once again, because it's a film about magic, I've also been trying to, so when we're touring, uh, Sean, who's the main magician in the film, does a magic show after the performance, um, and then we do a QA and a uh, to kind of make you know an event and give people a reason to get off the couch and come out. So um, for the other places that we can't attend personally, I've been trying to book local magicians uh, to come in there, and where possible, we're doing Zoom Q and As once again to give it make it more of an event. Um, and so yeah, I was really surprised. Uh, obviously, you know, it's tedious. Uh, I cold emailed at least three hundred cinemas to get the thirty or so screenings that we have. Um, but, you know, for three weeks that the plays in multiple, you know, all these are very small cities, places I'd never heard of before. Um, but there is a great website called Cinema Treasures um, that basically lists every theater that currently operates or has ever operated in North America, I think of the world, actually. Mm -hmm. And so I just started going alphabetically. So I made it basically through the about the d's i think and i just ran out of time and i was also doing it all myself there's only so many cities i thought i could uh you know service well sure um some of the screenings you know have gone well some we haven't really sold any tickets for um but uh so i wasn't really planning to expect to make a ton of money but um the distribution costs are so minimal you know by the sending them an mp4 or a dcp maybe i sending them the poster so it doesn't really cost me anything to be in any of those cinemas sure. um and um yeah it's all just about building awareness uh for the vod where i expect we'll find the largest part of our audience where so what, what would you say is the difference between the the cinemas that you've sold tickets well is is that like the marketing or do you think it's kind of just the town that that cinema's in what do you think attributed to the success of certain screenings compared to others uh, well, the most successful one we had was in Vancouver, our hometown. So, you know, I would hope that we can pull a, a good crowd there. I think the ones where we have been, um, like I said, Sean is a pretty big name in the magic world. Uh, so the ones where he's been appearing and where people can come and talk to him. Uh, we've also done after parties in some of those cities. Um, so you get to come, you know, and just rub elbows and, and talk with them after. I think uh, people are attracted to that. Um, um and the other ones yeah i think it's also just been the kind of the strength of the magic community um it, having the magicians come out in those cities has been great as well because that's another person who's helping us promote um and if we've been able to get a little bit of extra press there uh the strength of the mailing list i guess of those cinemas in terms of being able to reach out and uh, to their own clientele and find people um 
yeah, uh, I think those are probably the main factors. Do you think that, you know, moving forward, I know this is all, all the setup for the VOD release, but do you think moving forward with your next project that you'll do another tour for that project? Do you think it's something that can take a project from, you know, a small group of viewers to giving it a lot more word of mouth? I think it definitely helps. Um, I mean, one thing I've learned because uh, I hired a publicist to help out with this and um, there aren't a lot of critics left writing about film anymore. And so you will not get reviewed unless you're doing a week long run. Um, and most of the cities where we've been doing is just been two cities. So um, so that's been, you know, a good learning lesson. Um, but yeah, I think so. It, it's, it's just something it makes it easier to get something written about, I think, um, is that if you're doing some kind of event if you're traveling with the cast especially um and you're just doing something different than just a movie going straight to vod like we talked about before it's always going to be really hard to compete uh, compete um against films that have you know marketing budgets um but you know i not I never really expected to make my money back specifically on this tour but anything that i don't make back is just by marketing costs and um got it got it so, it. so you kind of you kind of did a hybrid instead of uh, just, hey, let me do social media ads and, and Facebook ads and Google ads. You said, hey, let me take some of this budget. Let me go and actually tour it, show my face, have the cast speak to audience members and at least leave, uh, create an event and leave a lasting impression on people that turn up to the um, screening. Yeah, I think word of mouth is really important. And so we've been getting really pretty, you know, very warm receptions everywhere we go. Um, and so counting on those people to be passionate about it and go, hey, you know, tell tell your friends about this really cool thing that we did. We, you know, we bought ads and stuff also, but there's even that, I mean, it's kind of a drop in the bucket. So I think the ads maybe generated a bit of uh, interest and, and drawn some people out. But um, I don't think I would rely entirely on that. Um, I think, you know, hearing something about your buddy who went to see this film and had a really good time is going to have more impact on you than a little pop up that uh, you're going to close as quickly as you can. Yeah, absolutely. And would you say that, you know, uh, you said earlier that um, if it sits in a theater for a week, then people will be more than likely to write about it. Now, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but is it any theater? Like it could just be an independent theater. And then how do they know that it's been sitting there for a week? Is there something that theaters have to do with, with films that sit there for a while? Like, how does that work? Well, you're, you're reaching out to the, you know, the, the journalist before. Oh, okay. um, and I think, and I think the, the logic and it makes sense is that, you know, if I'm going to write about this thing uh, and then people are only going to have like one chance or two chances to go see it versus, you know, they have a week to go and make it out to the theater, then the odds are better that you're from the journalist perspective, the critics perspective that, you know, the, what they're writing about is going to have an impact. So I think you didn't get a ton now, unfortunately, um, but uh, hopefully we'll get more around the VOD release. Um, uh, but I think just being able to say that, you know, we played all these, played all these cities, sold all these tickets um, and uh, and generated some buzz. So, you know, we filmed testimonials at uh, a bunch of the theaters. So we have, you know, people talking, the things, that, things that we can share on our socials about, you know, people saying, I've seen this movie, it was great. Uh, even if you're not a Magic fan, uh, you'll find something in this too. Um, and the other upside for us, you know, not a lot of documentaries can do this, but uh, we got merch. And so that's been another way of making money is that we're selling playing cards and all sorts of different kinds of uh, accessories. Sean's there to sign them. Um, and so that's been another revenue stream that we've been able to, to take advantage of. So that's, that's actually nice that he's actually touring with you because you know the project is centered around him. So the fact that he's there with you carries a lot of weight because like you said, the people that know him in the magic world they're gonna show up so they can see him. Maybe he'll, does he do live tricks and stuff and just kind of wows the crowd too? Yeah, he does. Uh, after the after the film, he does like a twenty minute show, uh, and then we hang out in the lobby. And while you know I'm selling stuff, he's talking to people, he's taking pictures, he's signing autographs, um, and so that's yeah, just another reason for people to come out because they're actually getting a live experience. Yeah, no, that that is awesome. What are you most excited for uh, with the release of this to the world? Like, what what are you excited for fans to to take away from this? project 
Uh, I'm excited about sleeping because I haven't had a lot of that lately. <laughs> um, but uh, like I said, I, I, I hope people walk away with a better appreciation for the art form, uh, also for a deck of cards. Um, you know, uh, we talk a lot about the history of cards, design of cards. We share things with you that you know you've never heard of before. Like one of the coolest things I learned about this in, during this process is the 52 factorial, which is this gigantic number that describes a number of possible combinations that exist in a deck of cards. It's like a it's like 80 digits long. It's a gigantic number, and it basically means that every time you shuffle a deck of cards, so uh, chances are there's never ever been a deck of cards in that exact order, or wow. will there ever be? So every time you shuffle a deck of cards, you are creating an absolutely unique order um, that's never been seen before, which is a pretty mind blowing idea. Um, so that you learn more about deck of cards, about this very common object that's. Uh, that you think that you know everything about. Um, and so maybe that kind of helps you open your eyes to other things that are around you in your life that you sort of take for granted. Um, and um, yeah, and also that this opens other opportunities for me um, because uh, there's only so many films that I can afford to pay for myself. And so I'm hoping this uh, creates some professional opportunities for myself where other people will see the film and enjoy it and uh, might want to bring me on for their projects too. So how many, how many features do you have under your belt now? This is my third feature, first as a director. Okay, and you know, I think what you just said at the end is very fascinating because as a filmmaker, your goal is to, hey, let me create something that's so impactful or resonates with someone that they say, hey, I wanna bring John on to shoot this project, right? Is, is there a preference, right? Like, let's say that person's listening and they see it and they're like, wow, I love this. Is there a preference as to what that project could be? If you could choose, like, hey, I want to do a sci-fi film that's set in on Mars, you know, like, what would that be? Uh, I'm open to just about everything. I mean, like, I'm not a horror guy, so I don't think I want to make that. But um, I, uh, yeah, I'm open to just about any kind of opportunity. Um, like I said, I've worked in the industry for a long time and I'm looking forward to the place of not needing a day job anymore and just being able to make a living off my creative skills. And I recognize that off the top that mm, those may not all be my favorite ideal projects, um, but they're all kind of stepping stones to getting in the right direction. Every short film, every feature is, you know, a step towards the ultimate goal. Um, and so if that, you know, these first couple of projects maybe not be my favorite thing in the world, but it's something I'm getting paid for and I get a directing credit out of it. And it's just something else that is uh, on my resume uh, and I'm learning from the, the process as well. Um, then those are all great things. So let me ask you this. Um, you know, it, it's September 10th, right around the corner. We're talking seven days. Lost in the Shuffle is coming out. What, what's like, if you could pick like one type of story, right? Like, like I know you're open to anything, but if you could pick one type of story that you think you would really excel at, like you're like, okay, my style, my influences, who I take inspiration from, this type of story is what's gonna, what, what I feel like I can take it to the next level from paper to end product, what would that be? I'm a big fan of magic realism. Uh, so directors like Genet or Michel Gondry, um, Spike Jones, um, those kind of guys uh, who show you a world that looks mostly normal, but then there's just gonna be this touch of fantasy, this weird element, this unexpected thing uh, that kind of flips that entire paradigm upside down. Um, I really like those kind of films. Um, so yeah, if that's if I had to pick a genre, that's that's where I'd lean. Awesome, man. Okay, so before I let you go, what's the best advice that you could give other indie filmmakers? They're working on their first project, whether it's a feature or a short film, and they're listening to this. What would you tell them? Um, I think like picking a date and saying this is the first date of photography um and it can be intimidating because you may not really have you know a lot of resources or you maybe feel that you're very far away from being ready to do that but there's something about saying that this is when it starts that makes it real even though if, even if there's a ton of other hypothetical uh and you know things that are up in the air that you can't account for um having that deadline and people are telling people okay on this date you know cameras roll um makes it real in their minds too and then you're makes it easier to get people on on board 
that you know they can commit and say okay this is at least a couple of weeks on yours um and it just gets the ball rolling it solidifies it and so and it, you know it, once you start talking about it it commit, commits you as well and so if you know if you're a person who uh maybe procrastinates or something once you put that out there in the world you don't want to have to <laughs> claw that back so i think yeah committing to that first date and saying this is when it happens makes things happen that, that's great advice and what about three if you could find three doesn't have to be three but if you could what are some pitfalls that you know a beginning filmmaker they'll probably more than likely run into what are those pitfalls that they could try to avoid ahead of time uh a huge one that i think we all mess up with is not leaving any money at the end um or marketing you, yeah exactly <laughs> So I, I totally lucked out and um, that my post-production company came in as an investor. So I didn't have to pay any for any of my post up front. Um, so that left me money to do the marketing and to be on this tour right now. So I was falling into that same trap. You want to put all your all your dollars on the screen and that totally makes sense. But if you, you can make the most beautiful film in the world and if no one knows it exists, then you've kind of shot yourself in the foot. Um, so I think that's a big one. Um, I think uh, trusting the people that you hire to work with you. Um, no one likes to be micromanaged. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a generalist. I understand a lot of things about film, but I, I'm not a cinematographer. I'm not an editor. I'm not a sound recordist. I'm not an animator. And, uh, you know, X number of other positions after that. Uh, so if you're going to, to hire people, trust them and, you know, let them give them the freedom to, to bring their ideas and their contributions to the project. You'll get much more out of them because they feel that they're valued. Um, and you'll get great ideas that you would never have thought of yourself. Um, and the third one, feed people. <laughs> food's very important yeah <laughs> you know what food is i think food especially like if you if you can come up with good food that is more important than like almost even like a minimum half minimum payment it's like if you can come up with some delicious food i think people are more than likely to show up enjoy the process be a part of the creative energy get their tummies full and they'll go home satisfied the grilled cheese truck that comes around at like the 10th or 11th hour of your day, um, you know, doesn't cost a ton of money, but it's great for morale. So what camera uh, and lens combo would you want to shoot on next for your next film? If you could pick, if you could pick, it could be anything. What would it be? IMAX. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Nolan, I'm, that's what I'm going. Uh, well, Here we come. John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Guys, I'm Jason Park with the Hypertube Podcast. Make sure you check out Lost in the Shuffle September 10th on VOD. John Ornoy. Lost in the Shuffle.film. Lost in the Shuffle.film. John Ornoy, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for having me. All right, have a good one.